Good morning, Joanna. Hi, Sarah. I'm Sarah Posner, and this is The Posner Show. And today, my guest is the wonderful Joanna Brooks, otherwise known as Ask Mormon Girl on Twitter. And that's also the name of her blog. And she's also the author of the book, The Book of Mormon Girl. And she is going to talk with me today about the recent essay or series of essays po posted at the LDS website, um, admitting that uh, the Mormon prophet and founder of the faith, uh, Joseph Smith, practiced polygamy. So let's just start with the timing of all of this. Um, uh, I think what really started the ball rolling in terms of everybody talking about the essay was Lori Goodstein's piece in the New York Times uh, earlier this week. Uh, which basically said the church made official what everybody knew all along, knew. <laughs> which is what, which is that uh, Joseph Smith practiced polygamy and had up to 40 wives, including uh, a girl as young as 14. Uh, and I was poking around a little bit and I saw that Peggy Fletcher Stack, who writes for the uh, Saint, uh, the Salt Lake uh, Tribune, Trib. uh, had covered the essay pretty much contemporaneously when it appeared on the LDS website uh, in late October. Uh, but uh, I think that you would have to know that as a reporter, you would have to know that this essay was happening, maybe not through the normal reporter means of maybe getting a press release or a statement from the church, um, because there was no such uh, splashy rollout for this thing, right? No, absolutely not. <laughs> Um, you know, this essay is part, one, of, one in a series of essays on topics, is how they're labeled on the church website, that the church has released during this calendar year. It started with an essay on the um, historical segregation of the Mormon priesthood and full participation in Mormon temple rights for members of black African descent. That essay rolled out, I think, in February. And it was the same sort of even-handed but unsigned, unattributed, you know, but, you know, creditable historians, academic treatment of the subject, providing sort of a full disclosure of information. Um, you know, the early essay that dealt with race was about, you know, ordination of black men early in the days of the church and how the ban came into being and under what conditions it was rescinded. And it, the church has rolled out two or three essays in the past few months addressing polygamy its origins, its practice in the Nauvoo era, its practice in, in Utah, and now Joseph Smith's own practice of polygamy. And all of these have been part of, you know, a carefully orchestrated movement, um, well, pressured by Mormon, Mormonism's progressive fringes for, but, you know, negotiated through sort of diplomatic emissaries within the church institution uh -huh. for greater openness on the part of the church in regards to its history. So Mormons know, through <laughs> word of mouth, that... Joseph yeah, I mean, Smith practiced polygamy. This was no secret well, to Mormons, I mean, this is, right? This is, this, is, this is the crazy thing. I, I, I was racking my head the other day trying to figure out when I didn't know. Um, <laughs> right. You know, in the 1980s, um, there was a book called Mormon Enigma written by two independent Mormon feminist historians. It was published, I think, by Not. It received a wide national release. It sold through several editions. It was republished by University of Illinois. And it was basically about Joseph Smith's first wife, Emma. And it was completely about polygamy and about Emma's anger and heartbreak and right, Joseph's sure. humanness. And they were blacklisted. They were not allowed to speak at church functions. They were not allowed to promote their book in church functions. I mean, this evidence, this this story about Joseph Smith has been available to all of us. It's there in Mormon scripture, you know, in the in the Doctrine of Co Doctrine and Covenants, there's a, a section where the doctrine of polygamy is revealed. So we know Joseph Smith is revealing a doctrine of polygamy and practicing it. So some of my friends are saying, scratching their heads and saying, when didn't you know? And other people, but we hear stories and I've met people who said, I grew up LDS in the 80s and 90s or the aughts, and had no idea that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. And I think this just reflects the larger culture of information management within Mormonism that, you know, in the last decades of the 20th century, early decades of the 21st century, if it's not published by the church, some members were completely discounted it. So they for, for, only took their information about the church from the church. So for Mormons younger than you, they were they were subject to that culture of information management. And so for them, for these younger Mormons who right. uh, 
sort of ironically have more access to information than right. you did when you were growing up because they have the internet. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, right. So there exactly. was more of a concerted effort to try to make it seem like what was true never happened. Or, yeah, or, and or at least we're not going to acknowledge that it happened. And the version of Joseph Smith that was given to them was this highly managed, standardized curriculum about his greatness and his achievements as founder of the church without getting into these messy human aspects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, so, you're right. So uh, these messy human aspects. So, like, obviously, Joseph Smith was a human being. He was not, um, you know, he was a mere mortal, but he was a prophet. And was he not, I mean, was he not considered to have received an inerrant word from God or an ear, er, 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 the way he translated the revelations that he received? I mean, is that not supposed to be flawless? Or Uh, obviously, that's a question of orthodoxy versus non-orthodoxy, but... Exactly. And that's, and that's what my essay up at Religion Dispatches this week tries to address. It says, okay, great. The facts have now been presented mm-hmm. in an LDS church format. What's left completely unaddressed and unsupported theologically is this question of errancy and inerrancy. Right. And also the doctrinal question of whether or not polygamy was, as Mormons would say, an eternal principle. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact is that to this day, you know, the church's official policies pertaining to the eternal or temple marriage of members still reflect an assumption or leave room for an assumption that polygamy is the order of the eternities, that it's never been doctrinally abolished. It's never been removed from our canon. So lots of people worry that God really does want polygamy to exist. We're just not prepared to live it or we're not being asked to live it at this time. I mean, this is not uncommon thinking among contemporary Mormons right now. Okay, so let me see if I understand this. Yeah. <laughs> so because this essay, I mean, this essay seemed to me, I read it and it seemed to me to be aimed at acknowledging that uh, the prophet ha- did practice polygamy, um, that he did it out of um, a, a godly intention, you know, basically that this is what God was telling him to do, that polygamy was practiced in the Old Testament. Um, and he received this revelation that it should also be practiced now. Yet the, it, the essay also acknowledges that he was very secretive about it because that was an acknowledgement that the public would not uh, take very well to practicing polygamy, the public being the American public in the mid, or his wife, um, in the mid 1800s, that that would not have been a very popular practice. Um, But it, it almost hints at, you know, well, he was doing this because God was telling him to do it, but he also knew that this would not be very popular. And so it it wouldn't reflect well on this new religion that he was founding. But, and then further revelations later made us realize that we should get rid of it altogether. It is not gone altogether. (laughs) Not, not in the least. I, you know, I remember being nine years old and realizing what the implications of certain church policies on the books pertaining to temple marriage were that, you know, basically the policy is, if you are a man and you are widowed or divorced, but your first sealing, your temple marriage, you know, your civic marriage, your civil marriage may be annulled, but your temple marriage is not annulled, you may be sealed for eternity to another woman, right? So if your first wife dies or if you divorce your, divorce your first wife civilly but not in the eyes of the church, you, you may marry another woman for the eternities. A woman cannot do the same. So if a woman loses her first husband to whom she was sealed for eternity in an LDS temple, she may she can marry another man in the temple, but she cannot marry him for eternity, if that makes sense. And this is not, this seems like a small loophole, but it's actually an issue of grave concern to a lot of members. So you talk in your essay about being worried and anxious as a child yeah, about this. Absolutely. Because oh, you, absolutely. you were worried that you would possibly not be sealed Absolutely. to eternity for eternity to your spouse. Now, if no, if, no, 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 that I would be one of many wives because the okay. way the policy is written, it, it leaves open the possibility that yeah, we'll be asked to live polygamy someday. I mean, because you have to understand the Mormon concept of exaltation, which is 
Salvation is everyone gets saved. Exaltation is going to the best heaven there is. Right. In order to be exalted, you have to be married. And so the kind of logic you'd work out in your head as a 9, 10, 15, 16, 25, 40-year-old was, well, you know, maybe there's just a lot more righteous women than men. And if we all have to be married, how are we going to all get to heaven? And so you, you find yourself asking questions like, um, if my sister doesn't get married to someone for eternity, would I let her marry my husband so she could go to heaven? Okay, I'll do it. Okay. I mean, and these are real life scenarios. I was running as a teenager. I am not alone. Um, there's a, a major Mormon feminist and elder figure in our movement in Carolyn Pearson, whose work for the past three or four years has been collecting stories from Mormons about the impact of the continuation of polygamy as a doctrine that the church has not eradicated on the lives of everyday members and creating anxiety, worry. And in the case of people who've been widowed or divorced, you know, actual issues about who will the children belong to, if there's an issue from a second marriage, who they belong to in the eternities. I mean, these things impact real people's lives. The church has not definitively dealt with polygamy. So if a divorced woman, or let's make it simpler, if a woman is widowed, yes. is she sealed for eternity with her late husband? Yes. But if she remarries, exactly, she's not sealed for eternity with the second husband. Correct. But the, flip that over, and if a man is widowed, he's sealed for eternity with both wives. Correct. Now, so for, and the church has not fixed this, and so and the, they've been asked. And the anxiety is what? So the anxiety is that, that this reflects the larger intention of God that polygamy is the order of the eternities. Polygamy for and the men, church for men to practice it for men. To, to, oh yeah, yeah. Right. So it's, it's as if the, I mean, correct me if I'm reading this wrong. So the church has uh, addressed this as a matter of policy and law, yeah. civ- civil law, but yeah. has not addressed it as a matter of theology. Correct. Correct. A- and it's it a- is completely unresolved and yeah. it causes a great deal of anxiety. So, and so this, <laughs> that's essay, why not all of us are like the rollout answers everything. It doesn't. It, yeah. So, so it doesn't address that question no, in the in the least. I mean, it no. doesn't. It, it, it's basically trying to place Smith's actions in a historical context right. uh, that would make it seem less scary and weird to right. people who would right. think that polygamy is scary and weird. Right. Um, and also, to I think they're trying to address the dynamic that gets set up when the church, it, kind of the an unintended consequence of its own careful control over information, which is that in the internet era, as members have greater access to information from quote the outside um, and the outside means even books written by Mormons that are published by non-Mormon or non-church presses. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, anything that's unofficial then has the power to um, make the church look like it's hiding things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's, that's what this essay was designed to address was the cultural dynamic that's emerged in the last five to 10 years of, you know, middle-aged Mormons getting on the internet one night and learning a whole other version of their history and that is not corroborated at LDS.org. So if there is a safe official version of the complicated, messy aspects of our history at LDS.org, it unplugs that feeling that I was betrayed, I wasn't informed. Okay. That's what this essay is for. I mean, is it also, I mean, Obviously, it took a while for the general public to catch up with with it, with the essay being there. As you point out, it's not noticeable. You can't get to it if you just go to LDS.org. There's no logical or clear way to get to the essay. You'd need to have a URL to get to it. Correct. Um, But, you know, it really didn't take that long for the general public to catch up with it because it was in the New York Times a couple weeks after... It appeared on the LDS well, website. And the, Times, and the Times is part of, you know, the Times has done some great reporting in the last couple of years about these dynamics within progressive Mormonism of, mm-hmm. of you know, declension and, um, you know, feelings of feelings that one's been betrayed and, you know, the, the push for a more open history. So the Times has been on this story. Right, right. And so you got to figure that the church officials knew that this would eventually happen and that it wasn't just written for Mormons, that it was written for the general public no. also, yes. right? Yes. So that, so that, okay, don't feel so discomfited by finding out that one of Mitt Romney's ancestors practiced polygamy. Yeah. I mean, that's the fun. I mean, yes, exactly. The church is, the church is very careful and very image conscious um, and church historians are deeply invested in their, they're very fine historians working under the auspices of the LDS church who want to practice the historian's craft, 
with openness, with, you know, with a high degree of rigor. Um, they're thrilled that this is coming out. Um, and it was all designed, you know, really to move us closer so that to reconciling the version of history we tell ourselves on the inside matches the version of history that the most creditable historians on the outside tell about us. Right. So yes, that reconciliation was the goal. So does it, does talking about this change Mormons' perceptions of Smith? I mean, is there a possible way to read this as, you know, Smith was basically just, you know, uh, he liked to get around. <laughs> I mean, I know, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. No, I right? know. I mean, but I it's mean, sort of like, you know, that's how an outsider would, would look at it, sort of like, you know, who, you know, and... I understand that, you know, he, his faith claim is, right. I received this revelation from God. This is how we're right. going to be sealed right. together for the eternities. Right. And so, but how do you avoid an outsider just saying, here was a guy who was just, who just liked to have a lot of women around him? Well, I, I think what you're indicating is the extent to which even a carefully crafted historian's essay doesn't reconcile with, you know, without addressing the more fundamental issues of, you know, is polygamy still a part of Mormon doctrine? It's still in our scriptures and it's still in our policy. You know, is right. it still, is it still really the view of the church that this is the order of the eternities? You know, and, you know, the, the, without that larger question being answered, the church can't move towards a new theory of who Joseph Smith was. And, and, right, and that's, right. that's, that's, that's a heavy lift. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think many of us who are less orthodox, you know, are comfortable saying, a charismatic religious leader in the 19th century, a time of communitarian experiments in American religion. Mm -hmm. um, not surprising that he might have, you know, innovated or flouted marriage norms. Not surprising that he would have felt a kind of theological sanction or crafted a theological sanction for his seeking, you know, for his, um, you know, um, for the consequences of his charisma, right? Uh -huh. And there's even a theological way in which it makes sense. I mean, you know, one of the things that's, to me, very fascinating and powerful about Mormon theology is that, you know, it comes out of a Protestant tradition, but in traditional Protestantism, salvation is covenanted between the individual and God through Christ. Smith's view of, you know, salvation and exaltation in the eternities was that families are sealed, that we are, we are saved in, that, in as much as we are sealed to our kin, Right. So mm -hmm. we are we are saved in family units. We're saved in marital units. We're saved really in, in its most elegant formulation. We're saved as we are sealed to all of humanity across time, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful theological innovation. Now, you take that and you start looking around this community you have of seekers and thinking about the ways in which everyone is interconnected. And it makes sense to sanctify all those through right. marriage. I mean, that's that's a generous you know, theologically contextualized understanding of how Joseph Smith could have crafted a, a theological premise for what may have been human impulses. Um, yep. but, and, and Mormon feminist intellectuals are having these conversations amongst ourselves. We've always had these conversations amongst ourselves, but how this will penetrate the laity if there is no support for processing complexity from above is, is, is an open question. Right. Well, let's talk about something that you, something else you raised in the essay, and that is the short historical time frame that we're dealing with with Mormonism as compared right. to right. Uh, Protest Protestantism or Catholicism or Judaism right. or Islam, where yes. you, know, <laughs> right. you know we're dealing with a much longer period of time, a, a, a much different sort of historical record uh, uh, in terms of what's extant from the uh, historical record, uh, and you know. I mean, Joseph Smith lived in the 19th century in the United States. I mean, there's a vast historical record. Um, Absolutely. And so, but this was just, you know, 200 and, well, or, or, or yeah. <laughs> Let's frame it this way, too. I was talking with my husband Less about this. Less than 200 yesterday. years ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, think about it. the founding of the church is 1830. About, right. I mean, Smith's getting revelations earlier than that. The Book of Mormon is happening earlier than that. But the founding of the church is 1830. When's okay. the Pittsburgh platform? 1890 something, right? I mean, so you have the, the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh platform in Judaism. The Pittsburgh you know, in, in platform in oh, Judaism. Oh, right, right. Uh huh. Right. Uh -huh. And so just think about that's one lifetime. That's seven decades, maybe, from 
the fabulous origins of a new American faith to when many other American people of faith are sitting down and reconciling their traditions against the historic record, against scientific evidence, against modernity. Think and against about that. Orthodoxy. Right. right. Mm-hmm. I mean, so 60 to 70 years, right, from these fabulous origins to when the world starts looking critically at faith against science, mm-hmm. against the historical record. I mean, that's the short window of Mormonism. And we find actually. Mormon scientists and historians in the early 20th century, a historian named B.H. Roberts, I think it's 1908, is writing a multi-volume history of the church and opens it with the acknowledgement that church leaders were human beings. So Mormonism has had the capacity to do what other faiths did, which is in seven or eight short decades from its own foundations to hold those foundations in a human and critical point of view. Mm -hmm. But that was pretty well eradicated with the LDS Church's sort of corporate emergence, the bureaucratization of the church, um, the bureaucratization of its curriculum, standardization of its theology. So that capacity for critical thinking about our own past that Mormon people were capable of pursuing, like other people of faith, in the same time frame, was sort of hammered out by the institution, if that makes sense. Right. And so, but the institution had a lot of things to protect. The institution had... Right. I mean, polygamy... Property. Polygamy just dis- polygamy destroy well yeah polygamy virtually dis- destroyed the church because the church you know under U.S. government orders the church's assets were seized because of polygamy I mean you know polygamy w- almost ruined the whole thing <laughs> you right know, and so. so that's why they have to have this very carefully crafted yes. message that we're against yes. polygamy but then right. insiders know well you haven't really resolved this issue for us yes. about. Yes. eternal life and yes. Um, yes. help us do that. And so, so what would stop them? I mean, would it be, would it just be apostasy to say that I think Joseph Smith came up with polygamy as, as a theological, you know? No, yeah. no, no. Would it be apostasy to say, okay, so, um, you know, a, a, a widowed woman can be sealed for eternity to two or three husbands. No, and that's the crazy thing. You know, in sealings, Mormons do posthumous sealings as well, right? So when you're dealing with ancestors who are married multiple times, you seal everybody to everybody for eternity. Right. So we don't understand why this policy that causes actual pain in actual people's lives persists with the sealing of the living. But the church will not, is not addressing it. Why, has been why do you think that is? Because it sort of seems like it oh. seems like such an internal thing. It doesn't seem like the sort of thing that the outside world cares that much about. Like they 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 seem to have cared very much about what the outside world thinks about the practice right. of polygamy within the history of Mormonism, and right. they seem to be trying to deal with that here. Right. right. But this thing that actually affects Mormon lives, Mormon lives. And that people are very upset and concerned about. It's like they, they, they don't seem to want to touch it, but it seems like it wouldn't have any impact on how the outside world views Mormonism because it could be seen right. as such a you know insidery thing that who else right. is going to really care whether they change it? Right, right. So what's their, what's their stake in maintaining it? Right. Which goes to suggest that the leadership of the church, the very traditional leadership of the church, continues to view polygamy as an eternal principle. Yeah. <laughs> well, now that you've busted that door wide open. <laughs> so you're, but I, I guess I'm still trying to grasp at why changing it, right? So that widowed women could be sealed for eternity to two husbands or three husbands, however many times they remarry. Right. Why that would undermine because polygamy just goes one way yeah. in their belief. It only goes one way that yeah. a man can have multiple wives, yeah. but a, a, yeah. a woman can't have multiple husbands. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's just sort of straight up sexism. I mean, th- or what, or, or yeah. just that Smith was a male. And so we have to do it the way Smith did it. Well, I mean, it, it, they, the pattern is after the biblical pattern is after the old Testament patriarchal okay. pattern. Okay. But you know, but we do find evidences during some of the most expansive and fascinating moment, you know, de- decades in Mormon history that there were women who were sealed to multiple husbands. Really? You know, oh, absolutely. Powerful women like Eliza Snow were sealed to both Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. I mean, every Everybody was sealing everybody to everybody at some point. If you were in Mormonism's hierarchy, um, you know, right. there but was just sort for of the, a, for the rank and file person. 
Yeah, I, mean, I rank and file. I don't know if there are evidences. I'm not a 19th century Mormon historian. I don't mm-hmm. know if there are evidences of rank and file. You know, sort of lower caste, you know, middle caste Mormons, because there was really a hierarchy mm-hmm. culturally. Um, non elite families were doing that kind of expansive practice of plural marriage, but no, you find it among the Mormon elite in like 1850s, 60s, you know, and 30, 40s Nauvoo era ceiling of women to multiple husbands. It was just it was done, not extensively, but it was done. So, you know, there's so much that's not been addressed and answered about polygamy. Uh. So do you think, and, and I know that, um, you know, there's a whole movement within Mormonism to um, per- permit women in the priesthood. And would you think doing that would potentially change this teaching on polygamy? You know, I, I think the church has some heavy lifts ahead of it on gender. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Joseph Smith's teachings on gender were what record we have of them from the Nauvoo era of the church from the 1840s were, were pretty progressive. Um, he is actually on record. Well, we have sources in the 1840s saying that Joseph Smith said to women that he intended for them to have a form of priesthood and that this, you know, understanding of priesthood is something shared by men and women or held by women as well by virtue of their participation in Mormon temple rites persisted through the 20th century um, before it was sort of bureaucratically minimized and then lost. Um, So, you know, basically Mormonism has this sort of set of unanswered questions about gender that we find Joseph Smith asking and sort of setting into motion some pretty powerful symbolic patterns and ritual patterns um, pretty suggestive ones that Brigham Young backed away from. Brigham Young was far more conservative than Joseph Smith um, on social issues, and that we've been struggling to understand how they apply now. And because Mormonism doesn't support a class of professional theologians, we don't have systematic theological inquiry into these unanswered problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're left to church hierarchy to address. And an orthodox view would be, well, you know, God will tell the prophet what needs to be addressed next, and God leads the process. Those of us who are students of Mormon history of Revelation know that members have always played a role, um, including a scholarly role, in, you know, driving and helping, you know, uh, bring momentum to important questions that the church hierarchy then considers in a prayerful, revelatory way. So, you know, there's just, there's a lot of work to be done left on gender. Would ordination of women eradicate the polygamy problem? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It depends on which women got ordained and how. (laughs) Right. Of course. Of course. (laughs) So, but you know, I I just think that both ordination and polygamy belong to this constellation of unanswered questions that the church has shown very little appetite for addressing in a serious way. So I think that the public's understanding of polygamy, or at least polygamy, how it's in practice, is shaped by Warren Jeffs, uh, the TV program, Big Love, that reality TV show, whatever it was called, Sister Wives, was that, is that what it was called? And then there were, I, saw, I, I just saw a commercial for one the other day, like there's another one, um, another reality show, the name of which I can't remember at the moment. Um, so, I mean, but obviously these are depictions that are, well, obviously Jeff's is an extreme example, um, but Big Love and the reality TV shows are, you know, they're made for TV. It's the reality shows are, you know, <laughs> made for entertainment. Um, But I will say that one of the families featured in, the family featured in the Sister Wives reality show, they're actually plaintiffs in a very, very creditable legal case that's really moving its way up through the ranks of the federal courts in terms of um, legalizing polygamy. In Utah? Do they live in Utah, that family? Yeah, Yeah. they do. So how many people, um, Uh, how many people or families, or is there any way to count or, or, um, uh, how many people practice polygamy in the United States? I am out of date on my stats. I just uh, pulling a number out of thin air. I th- you, it, it's somewhere probably in the neighborhood of a hundred thousand people or people. Yeah, people. Um, and so yeah, it could be. It, yeah, it could be smaller than that, but maybe about a hundred thousand. So in in Utah, is it kind of an open secret that there are a lot of people yeah. practicing the polygamy? Yes. And, Absolutely. And so, you see, you see folks at the Costco. Right. Right. Uh, and so, and, and they live, you know, and it used to be that, especially as they've been, as a polygamous people have been represented, um, in the media, especially around the time of the Jeff's raids, mm-hmm. you know, those are the most extreme splinter sex. It used to be that those com- communities were confined 
to a small geographical strip along the Utah Arizona border. Um, that's really no longer the case. There's much more settlement in, for example, the Salt Lake suburbs mm-hmm. now, um, especially on the west side of Salt Lake um, County. Uh, there's there are large polygamous communities, you know, within within a very easy commute of Salt Lake City. So you see them at the suburban Costco. You and really so do. Are these people? And cons- they look like you and me. Yeah. And are they considered part of the LDS Church? No. Nope. No. Okay. No. So is church it ra- is really scrupulous about excommunicating anyone. So these folks get these folks married. get excommunicated. Yes. Yeah. The church is absolutely scrupulous about that. And has anyone tried to form a splinter or schism church? Yes, there are many. Mm-hmm. There are many splinter or, you know, offshoot. I mean, the Mormon movement has 14 organized branches at least. Uh-huh. You know, and, ev- and within the past few years, even within, among Mormons who trace their roots back to Joseph Smith, there are, you know, sex and splinter groups always forming anew. So there's a very lively organizational culture among Mormon fundamentalists. And so do they, I mean, basically by the virtue of a particular leader's charisma, they're able to uh, claim that they are, notwithstanding what the LDS church's right. position on this is, right. that they're they're yes. the true heirs of Smith's yes. legacy on this issue. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Well, listen, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for talking about all of always this. Always a pleasure. Always right. a pleasure. Take care, Jenna. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.